thanks everybody for coming out. I know it's a gorgeous day outside and uh, after lunch it can be a little hard to come back in here and get into it. So um, we're, my, I'm George Bohenick. This is Randy Jones. We're going to be talking today about building and deploying applications that are production ready. We work in professional services here at Esri out of Washington, D.C. And in that role, we end up deploying a lot of large JavaScript applications across a number of clients. So over the course of, uh, of working on these applications, we found that there's definitely a need to put some care into the release of your applications. When you first start getting this process established, production can seem like a, sp a scary place. You know, people are hitting your page with ancient browsers, cell phones, slow internet connections, who knows what else. But it doesn't have to be that bad. Production can be a magical place. Everything loads faster, people get to see the work that you've done, you can make a difference there. You know, a lot of times we think an app is ready to go when development is done, when your code works is expected, QA signs off on it, you can just go. They'll work in a pinch, but there's a lot that can be done after development is complete to improve performance and to give them that user experience they really deserve. So most of these improvements are pretty easy to make and they can make a huge difference. The first one here is probably also the easiest and most straightforward way to get performance and that's gzip. Every server should be configured to utilize gzip or deflate to compress text files. Pretty much every modern browser and web server supports gzip for text compression and can reduce page size by up to 90%. It's a huge win when you think about it. you're only adding a couple of lines to your server config and you can reduce your page size by that much. So up here on the screen there's a small snippet of code and it's related gzip compression. That tiny piece of code got reduced by 47% from about 800 bytes to about 400. So that's a pretty huge win. And on a larger scale, that can be even bigger. We, uh, we ran some analysis before this presentation on a public-facing mapping application we found that didn't have gzip enabled. And uh, just enabling that compression reduced the overall page size by 1.2 megabytes. And that was 76% of the total page size. So please do this on all of your applications. Once you set it up, on one server, it works for all of your applications so you don't have to think about it every single time. It's just something you do once. So next on our priority list is always gonna be to minify every last bit of CSS, JavaScript, and HTML. We're gonna continue to take that page size down. So it's amazing how much extra room you end up losing when you get rid of white space, long variable names, comments, pretty much everything. Even images can be minified or optimized. So one of the image resources we're using, we get them off Google, we get them from our graphics department. Someone has designed these images. They're usually a lot bigger than they need to be for the web. They don't want to lose any of their data. But we really don't need that. You just need them to be the size that they're going to take up. So we want to, you want to resize every image as much as possible to the minimum. And that makes them smaller, but you can also load them in a smarter way and then you get more performance that way. So each individual network call that you're making from your web app is gonna give you a hit to performance. And we can reduce some of that by combining our images into one file that we call a sprite. And you put everything in one file, you can then control the width, height, and position of that file through CSS and reduce all of your image calls to one or just a couple of image calls. And that helps your performance quite a bit. And then, so once you get that, you get your images smaller, you get your code smaller, everything's deflated, you can get even more performance through browser caching. So this is again gonna be a server-side configuration and um, every server comes with a default, but usually that's pretty conservative. You can do a lot better. Um, if your app has static resources that don't really change, maybe it's a company logo, an agency description, something that's gonna be the same for a while, you can set that cache up to a year and they'll just keep it on their browser as long as they don't clear the cache. It's gonna really jack up your performance. Finally, we're gonna look at how the application itself is designed here. The order in which everything is loaded. 
When your browser goes through and loads a web page, each tag needs to be fully read and rendered before it'll move on to the next one. So this can be a problem if you're loading large JavaScript files near the top of your file synchron synchronously. So in order to give the user feedback quickly, applications should only use blocking scripts to load the data that's necessary for the initial load. Everything else can be loaded asynchronously or after the fact, when they click on a button, when they scroll to a certain area, any of that. And that also applies to CSS. So this one can be a little tough to wrap your head around just how this is working. I'm going to step through really quickly and show an example. So I have here. two websites. We'll look at the behavior first. So if I go to the first one, you can see that's labeled bad. And this one, I have all of my code loading at the very beginning. I've, uh, I've set it to work as about a 3G connection. And you can see I basically have a JavaScript file coming in here with about 200,000 comments or so, just to bulk up the size of that file. You can see it, was, it took a really long time to just get that text on the screen and draw that picture. What I've done in this second one is the same website, and the only difference is that I've added an async tab, tag to my, uh, to my blocking JavaScript. And you can see now that that text loads very quickly, while the JavaScript that's going to load my image is being loaded in the background. And that's going to give your users a much better overall experience you can set loading tags. You can maybe start loading a map before you start your more complicated analysis and make that available. And I find that what users want overall is to just know that something is happening and there's not a white page there staring them in the face. If we look at the code for this, when you first look at our bad one, you can see here it's pretty straightforward, a little jQuery. I load a processing JavaScript file, I load a style sheet, and here's this, uh, this loading message. It's not great, right? But it's just something very straightforward. The processing JavaScript file is huge. I change the image here, and then I have a whole bunch of nonsense that does nothing. If we look at the good version, you can see the only difference is this async word right here. And that made a world of difference to the actual performance of the application. So it's something just to think about when you actually go in your application, think about what it takes to load that initial thing, to give the users some feedback, and make sure you do that first, take it out of your core JavaScript files, and load it before anything else. All right. And like I said, that applies to CSS too. So if you have other sections of your page that use CSS that aren't loading right away, load those after the fact. Do it with some JavaScript, load them dynamically, load them asynchronously, whatever you have to do to get out of your own way. So there's a, there's a few things I've gone over here. It can be a lot to remember. Um, the technology is always constantly evolving. This page right here is uh, Google Page Speed Insights. It's a resource that we use that's pretty good. It, um, it'll take your website and it'll go through and scan for any common mishaps or best practices that people might miss out on. Um, here's what it looks like when I ran it to ArcGIS.com. It thinks there's a little bit we could do with that, but um, you can see it says to optimize the images, leverage browser caching, all those sort of things. Um, it's pretty cool, they have some great documentation uh, they'll tell you why you should be doing something and how to fix it, not just that there's something wrong. So that's definitely a great resource. Another good one here is um, this comes from the folks over at HTML5 Boilerplate. It's just a set of server, backend server configs. And uh, this is really good for that initial web server setup. They have settings in place in these files for, um, for gzip, deflate, browser caching, cores, a whole bunch of other type security settings that you probably want to implement. And they do a really good job at keeping this updated. 
So we've covered a few basic concepts here for building performance and getting things production ready, setting up your server. But out of all the optimization techniques we've used, we find the biggest difference when you're writing large mapping applications with the JavaScript API is by running the Dojo build. And what the Dojo build does is it provides a set of tools that help build your applications along with all of the AMD modules you're pulling in. So that'd be anything in the JavaScript API, any digits, any sort of require JS statements that you're calling. And it combines them all into a few single layer files. So what that's doing is similar to what we talked about with the image optimization. It's going to take out all of the white space. It's going to make your variable names shorter. And it's going to put everything into one or a few files. I'll pass it over to Randy now. And he's going to show us how to actually go through and do that. So just out of curiosity, how many people today are already using um, either a dojo build or some type of build to take their application to production? OK, good. So it looks quarter-ish maybe of the room. Uh, so the, uh, the best way to get started with doing the build is really to make sure that your project has good organization. Um, but it doesn't matter whether you choose to organize your code in a very flat manner or if you use a very nested structure. Um, you can configure the build to work with either of those. So the build that we're going to use uh, is going to utilize uh, Node.js. Uh, so you're going to have to have that installed as a prereq. And um, we'll start looking at what the requirements are to run the Dojo build. So the first thing that you're going to have to do is set up a build profile. Now this is going to tell Dojo all the things that are needed for it to pull together um, both your custom code and the JavaScript API in Dojo together into one or a few files that you're going to include in your application. So this is sort of a long looking file that you can see here, but there's really three sections of it that you'll probably need to customize for your own application. The first part up here is the base path. This is where you're going to have it run from. Um, so this is where all that code, all the packages, the Dojo packages are going to end up with and that where you're going to run them from, the build itself. Then the next section is this packages section down here at the bottom of uh, the screen here that we're showing on the left. Uh, so what this looks like zoomed in is this is both uh, where you're defining, this is kind of like the dojo config in your uh, index page. So you're defining the packages. So not only are we defining the dojo ones, but you'll need to add in and change it for your packages. You can see here the package that we're using in the sample application today is called build project. Um, so the way that we reference all the files that we might have in there uh, are, you know, build project slash controller slash toolbar, you know, those sorts of things. Those are our, our class, Dojo classes. The last section uh, that you need is the layer section. Now each one of these sections that you put in this layers is going to end up generating a JavaScript file. So in the example that we're showing here, we're building a dojo.js file. It happens to be in the dojo package. And you can see that we're telling it that we need to include these basic sets of uh, files, or sorry, of classes to put into it. Uh, we're telling it that this is going to be the one that we're going to start our application with. That's why the boot is there. And um, you can notice that we have our site manager class there. In this sample application, we're using that as sort of our controller uh, class. And that's really what initializes the whole application. So the next thing we need to do the build, we have our profile. But we actually need Dojo and the JavaScript API to combine together with our custom code. Um, so the easiest way to do this is through package management. And uh, we're going to use Bower as a JavaScript package management system to do this. This will just help us in the most easy way possible get the correct versions of Dojo, the JavaScript API, and uh, any dependencies, uh, dgrid, dstore, et cetera, that you might need. 
So Bower allows us to just pull all those really simply, um, and it's really easy to install and use Bower. So to start with, we'll install Bower, and Bower is something that we're, in, we're installing with the node package manager here. Um, the dash, dash G flag that we have set here uh, is letting it know that we want it to be installed globally. So when you're on your development laptop or whatever, you do this once and then you can use it anywhere, just like you install the program on the path. Um, and so once we have Bower installed, we can start asking Bower to pull down dependencies. So we're asking Bower in this case to install the RTS JavaScript API into our current project. And the little flag to save dev on the end is gonna let Bower know that we want it to create a Bower JSON file for us and save this dependency into it. We can just as easily um, pull things directly from GitHub using very specific tags so that we can uh, explicitly control what version of the API we might be getting. So the, the first install line is going to go look at uh, the Bower uh, repository and basically give you back the latest. What the second line is doing is because of the format of that line, it is knowing that it's gonna go straight to GitHub to get that, and in this case it's gonna download the 320 version of the JavaScript API. So what does then a Bower JSON actually look like? Because whenever we download an existing application and we're not starting from new, we don't need to go through and reinstall all those packages if we have a Bower JSON. We'll have this included in our project and then you simply just call Bower install. It looks to this file and downloads all the dependencies that you have listed in it. You can see this one is pretty simplified. Uh, this is an example with the 4.3 API um, being used. And it is actually correct that those resolutions down at the bottom are listed as 320. They're not tagging things in, uh, that are using the same version of Dojo currently uh, with both 4.3 and 3.2. And so since they release those versions at the same time, we know that those go together. So the thing that you don't see here is you don't see Dojo listed, you don't see Dgrid listed, you don't see DStore listed. And the reason for that is the JavaScript API itself has its own Bower file. So once it gets downloaded, Bower says, oh, you have additional dependencies and goes and automatically downloads them for you. So that will pull all the same, same packages that are hosted on the CDN that you might be using from the JavaScript API today. Um, so the next thing that we normally do in our projects is Bower by default downloads everything into a Bower modules um, folder. With the way that we do the build, we generally like to have it download to a different folder. Uh, usually it's something like a build source or uh, a build directory that we're going to do the dojo build in. This helps us limit the no amount of times that we need to copy data around um, while still preserving um, our source files and not muddying the water between the two. So the top example just installs it straight into the same directory that you're running the Bower install from. The lower one would install all your dependencies into a build source directory. Yep. So, so the um, next thing that we're going to do now that we have um, Bower installed. is we are going to, we're ready now to run the build. We have our build dependencies done and we uh, have our Dojo package file and now we're ready to run the build. Uh, but this isn't very pretty, is it? Uh, this is how we would run it from Node on the command line and um, I know I would hate this every time that we ran the build. Even if I wrapped it in a bat file or something like that, this is just not the nice way to do it. 
Uh, it also is very difficult to take this command and integrate it into uh, any sort of build automation that you might want to do, uh, pipelining, um, or you know, just run things locally on your computer. This is not the most elegant way to do it. So let's talk about a better way. Um, there's a lot more value if we start running this build from within other tools that allow us to do a lot, a lot more uh, to our application. Uh, because the reality is our applications are likely, especially over time, to grow in complexity, and we're likely going to need to do more to do the build itself. Um, so we can combine together steps of not just doing the dojo build, but really pulling all of our artifacts together for the distribution that we need to produce to put our application in our production server. So there's a lot more value if we're going to look at using uh, a task runner or a build system. Um, so right now you can see uh, gr Gulp and Grunt are both task runners. Uh, you could even write scripts in straight Node if you wanted to, straight JavaScript scripts to do the build. Um, but if you have a legacy application as well that might use some other existing build system, you don't need to change. Uh, we've done builds in both Ant and Maven, and I've seen it done with the TFS build system. So there's no real limitation to any of these other build systems. So if your enterprise already has something else or you're already using something else, you don't need to change to one of these tools that we're just talking about today. You can certainly do this all in the one that you're already using. So the example that we're going to go through today just happens to be using Grunt. Um, and you know, if you're new to this, Gulp and Grunt are both, I think, easy entry points uh, to this type of um, task running and, and uh, uh, scripting of tasks like this. So those would be great things to go look at. Uh, Grunt installs just as easily as Bower did for us. Uh, we can just do the M NPM install. And if you remember the dash G, uh, makes it global for us. So after I install this, I can go with a command prompt anywhere in my, in my system and just run grunt, and it will uh, try to do its thing, uh, assuming that all of the right things are there. Um, so we install the dependencies for grunt uh, using npm, uh, just like we do to install grunt. And uh, you can see here, it's got the similar format like Bower did. Uh, in this case, I'm installing Dojo, uh, the Grunt Dojo task, and I'm asking it to save it to the package JSON, which is the, the same sort of equivalent of the Bower JSON uh, the NPM uses. Uh, and here's another task that we're using there, uh, so you can see that just as an example. Uh, and you can sort of notice the difference of the two below, two on the bottom, uh, don't have that JAS G function. So we're just installing those and asking it to save, save it in a package JSON for our particular project. Uh, so here's just an example uh, package JSON. You can see all the dependencies that this project uh, happened to have. Um, and if I already have an existing project, new developer comes on, they download it out of Git or whatever source control you're using. Um, to get all these dependencies that they need, they just simply need to run npm install. And so just like Bower, uh, if it has an existing one, it'll look to that package JSON and pull it. So uh, this is the project that we're gonna be using, and we'll have this link again at the end of the presentation. Um, so we're just going to sort of step through and what does this look like in real life? Let's see here. Okay. Uh, so here's our GitHub repository. Um, we have a good readme up there as well. Um, it, if you go to it right now before George and I get a chance to clean this up, you will want to look at the JSAPI-4 branch. I just merged it. Oh. George just took care of it, never mind. <laughs> so this is the application that we're gonna look at today. It's, it's pretty simple. Uh, we got the, the nice dark gray uh, canvas map and we'll overlay some, some wonderfully looking transportation layers. Um, we also just have a little GP integrated as well where, where we can do a, uh, a travel. Um, 
drive times, that's the word I was looking for. Uh, analysis here uh, and just clear. So, you know, we have some basic functionality, but really what we're trying to highlight to you is not some awesome, huge whiz bang app here, but we're trying to really articulate the best practices here um, as well. So uh, with this app, um, I mean, I did a few things, but uh, if you happen to notice down at the very bottom, um, I don't think I can make this any bigger down here, can I? Yeah, there it goes. Okay. You hover over the request. Yeah, so um, down here in the bottom, you can see we did, um, it's 1.7 now after I, after I added the layer and did a few requests. It started out as 1.1 as megabytes and uh, just over 200 requests. So this is the unbuilt application that we're gonna look at. So let's sort of see what this application looks like. Um, on disk. So we can see a lot of the artifacts that we just talked about already. Uh, we have our Bower JSON, uh, very simple. We're using 4.3 in this application, uh, so it's a 2D 4.3 application. Um, we have our package JSON down here telling it all the uh, dependencies that we're using uh, within the application itself. Um, we have that build profile that I was talking about. Um, and versus the slide example, uh, you can see here we're actually going to build two layer files to be used uh, in the application itself. And uh, like we do down here, we still have our packages all nicely defined, uh, Dojo, Digit, Esri, uh, Dgrid, et cetera. And let's look at this index of this application real quick. Uh, you can see I have my web.js file with my uh, build project for all my uh, classes for this. If we look at the index file, uh, you'll notice maybe something that will be surprising to you uh, given this discussion. But one of the things that George and I have found uh, works really well, uh, for us at least, in, in the way that this project is set up, is we actually use the CDN for development. and. Then, as we go to QA builds and production builds, um, we'll replace the CDN URL with our built layer file as the output from the Dojo build. Um, so that'll be part of the grunt script that we look at here in just a second. It's going on. Um, but you can also see here um, the amount of code that we actually have here in the, in the application is very, very small. Um, the majority of things that are going to be happening um, are happening in our site manager class. If you recall, that's what uh, I said. It was sort of our controller object. And it's all going to be built. So we have very little code, very little anything that's not going to be run through the build uh, to be obfuscated, comments removed, uh, stripped of white characters. Uh, so it's going to be a really compact version of this. So I said that we're going to use uh, grunt for this. This is what a, a grunt file looks like. It's JavaScript, so it's um, something that I think should be fairly familiar to people to start picking up and using. Um, you can see I'm loading some tasks that we're going to be using. Uh, we obviously need grunt dojo because that's what's going to do the dojo build for us. And then we have some other things that help me with housekeeping and moving things around. Uh, we have the copy, a copy task, a clean task. Uh, we're going to replace that CDN URL that I mentioned in the index file. We're going to replace that to the dojo file. Um, and then George and I have some other great best practices in here already. Um, Karma for testing and JS hint for um, you know, making sure that our JavaScript uh, meets best practices as well. Uh, you can hear more about those things. We're going to be talking about testing at 4 o'clock, I think, in the same room. Uh, so you can come back for that if, that, if those topics interest you. Uh, so here's some setup for our clean task. Uh, we actually have three sort of subtasks of it. Um, you can see we're copying some things around here in the copy. Uh, here's where we're doing that replace later, um, where, where we have a few things taking Dojo out of debug mode and swapping that uh, JavaScript API URL to the Dojo.js and things like that. Uh, let's get down here to the meat of it, though. Uh, we're here to talk about the Dojo build. So we, we're pointing the Dojo build to where our build profile is. Um, and then we're sort of setting it with the things that it needs. The Dojo build uses Dojo to build Dojo. 
so uh, we have to tell it where the dojo file is. We're going to tell it that it's doing the build. Uh, we're telling it where we want the output to be. So the dojo build sort of goes through these incremental steps as it does things. So we're going to sort of hold off on this build temp file. We're going to put our sort of temporary artifacts. And um, this is actually a change if you happen to come to this presentation last year. Um, we, last year we sort of built everything in the disk directory and then sort of tried to clean ourselves up. And we figured out over the last year that if we do it this way, we save like a minute off the build time. So uh, sometimes that matters and it, it matters to us during our continuous integration process. So we saw that as a, as a good win here. And then we're telling it wh what directory it needs to do the build from. Uh, and we're putting everything in that build source JS directory. If you remember from that Bower JSON, that's why I'm sticking all the other things. Um, so what is the, what, is, what does the build look like as far as the tasks that we have to do? Down here in the grunt, we can see we're going to clean up if there's an old build. Uh, we don't want to cause any problems there. Um, we're going to copy some things around for the pre-build. We're going to start creating our disk directory here as well as um, copying our own packages that we need to build into that uh, build source file. We're going to run the dojo build. Um, that was pretty straightforward, I think. And then post build, this is where we're going to copy those layer files uh, that the dojo build outputs into the disk directory. We're doing that replace from the 4.3 to our new build one like I uh, spoke about. And then I have this post build cleanup just to clean up that temp directory that uh, we were talking about we're going to utilize uh, there. So now that we have all this, what is running the build actually look like? Uh, we can just do grunt and we want to tell it what task we want it to run. Uh, so I'm in the directory of my project right now and that's it. So this will run. Um, I'm actually going to not run it though. Uh, because what you will experience when you do this, and I'm going to take George's line uh, from later, but it makes your processor spin and it's going to take up like a full core or however much you'll give it and uh, sound like a jet engine or at least my laptop does. Uh, so we'll let, you know, everything actually run so I can click things. And, um, but so I have already here uh, prepped just from a little bit ago. Uh, this is that same application. Um, just built already. Um, so the same functionality, it loads. And if you see down here at the bottom, uh, we cut the load time in half. The load time originally was uh, just over 12 seconds. Um, the amount that we downloaded is uh, a little less, but you can see now we're down to 84 requests. And originally we were just over 200. Uh, so we've got a lot of gain in performance time here and a lot of gain in um, the amount of time it took to download. So even though the, the in kilobytes we went from like 1.1 to just under one megabyte, but we did that in half the time. And as your apps get bigger and bigger, you're going to see more and more of a performance gain there. So, um, <laughs> are we back in PowerPoint now? Yeah, I think we're back in PowerPoint now. All right, so, there you go. So this is all really great. It works. What about Web App Builder? Um, if you came to our presentation last year, we went through some of how we were experimenting with running this build on Web App Builder. Uh, Web App Builder lends itself really well to automation of the Dojo build. Uh, primarily, that's because it's a very opinionated framework. It builds out a known folder structure as a config file that's going to tell us what that folder structure looks like. And it's going to be very easy to predict. So over the last year, we've been able to simplify and automate that even further. We, uh, we've got it into a single NPM module now that's up on GitHub. So you can see here, it's a one-line install. It's going to continue to use like, uh, like the build that Randy showed. It's going to need Bower. So let me pull that up. I'm in a, uh, a web app builder app here. You can see it's pretty standard, has all the same things. I didn't install anything differently or copy any scripts in. And uh, I would go through, I would type ins npm install dash g bower if I didn't have it. 
If you do, there's no reason to go through and do it again. The only other command you're going to type, you're going to install the Esri Web App Builder build. So that's the same thing, npm install dash g Esri Web Build. So that's a big improvement from the last time. And you only have to do that once. Once that's done, you're good to go, and you can just do this, Esri Web Build, and hit enter. That's going to go through, it's going to start the build, and it's going to run it on your config file. So all your widgets are going to be loaded into one layer file. All the things that Web App Builder needs to load are going to be correctly loaded up, and it's going to reduce, it's going to give you some great performance. So let's take a look at this. Here's one that is unbuilt. It's a pretty standard Web App Builder. I've got here a legend, a layer list, and a draw tool. Nothing too fancy. You can see when I load it here, particularly looking at the JavaScript files only, it's loading everything, right? Web App Builder applications take a while to load. So we've got 138 JavaScript files out of 274 total files. Compare that to the built one here. I can refresh that, show JavaScript only, and I've got 22 JavaScript files now out of 114 total. That's huge. It's down to 3.75 seconds compared to 7.4. And that makes a big difference on whether a user stays and interacts with your application or just goes to Google Maps instead, that takes the next best that they can. All right. So how do you get this into your existing workflows? Randy's going to talk a little bit about that. Yep, so um, we can build an application now. This is great, um, but we're still really involved in the process. How do we make this more automated so that from development to production, uh, you have to do far less? And we get more consistent deployments and faster deployments. So um, there's a lot of great continuous integration tools out there. Um, uh, today we're just going to sort of show an example here in Jenkins. So the one good thing about this is all that work that we've done right now to set up our application, to run the build, um, we get to reuse that within our continuous integration pipeline. And so right now uh, I have a number of uh, jobs set up here in Jenkins. Um, and let's sort of look at the build one that I have uh, set up right now. Uh, you can see it's pulling from the GitHub repo that George and I have set up here. Um, we're still using that JavaScript API for branch. You didn't delete that, did you? Yes. Awesome. We'll, we'll see how this goes. It's <laughs> what we call live debugging. Yeah. Um, so now this one I actually have um, being built by uh, the completion, the successful run of my test job. And again, we'll talk about that a little more at 4 o'clock. Um, so you can see here the familiar steps that we said that you needed to do to do the build. Uh, we have the NPM install of the dependencies that we need. We have the Bower dependency installations and we're running the grunt build here. So these th three steps should yield us a working application. And assuming that it does build correctly without errors, um, what I'm gonna do here is I've told Jenkins to uh, make an artifact and archive that uh, of my disk directory. So this also gives me a really good way to roll back deployments if I need to uh, because any successful build in my, of my uh, job now, of my application, I can go into Jenkins and see the artifact that was associated with that build. So I can track and go back and download and even set up another job in Jenkins to do a rollback for me, pointing back to a specific build that we did. So I have a build. That's great. 
but it's just sitting there on disk. So the next thing that we can do is we can actually take this and deploy this. Um, I've, so I've set up this QA deploy because we're not just gonna roll, well, I mean, George and I roll things straight to production and it always goes horribly wrong. So uh, learn from us and do a QA build first. Uh, get it on your server so that uh, your, your QA testers or you yourself, depending on how big your shop is, can uh, do this test. And you can see here we have this deploying as soon as there's a successful test build. You can see we don't have it pointing at any source control. You might find that interesting. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna use that artifact that we archived from the build. So we're gonna say pull the last successful build of our build uh, job. Uh, we're just gonna copy it local so that we have it to work with without messing anything up in the archive. And since I'm sort of just de deploying this locally, um, I'm not using the, Jenkins has a built-in like deploy task that you can use to deploy to Tomcat or WebLogic or um, IIS or whatever you need to deploy to. Um, but since I'm just doing it locally, we're just, we'll just do a simple, simple copy here. Um, so when that happens, we, um, let's come back here. We can actually run this one. Uh, this one will be safe since it doesn't require, oh, you see, it, it went so fast you couldn't even see how fast it really went. Uh, so that deployed that there um, to, my, to my box, and that actually is this site back over here, my, my QA site. Um, so now we've got a, in a pipeline to our QA team. We can come in, we can test our application, make sure that it's working correctly, working as we want, and then we come down to a manual task. Um, this, uh, and by manual task, I mean we need to initiate this build ourselves. Those, the test build job that we have listed here and the uh, test QA deploy ones, those ones were automatically chained together when we passed our unit tests. So now, once everything's good, we can come in and we can say, okay, my application checked out correctly, I wanna deploy it to production. And the configuration for this one looks almost identical to the QA build in this case. Uh, you know, we're pulling the artifact from the QA build and we're deploying it to production. Now, this is a great place where you could add in a node script also, or you could use grunt. If you needed to, say, uh, replace a web map ID or you know change out the name of something so that it doesn't say test anymore but you know is the real name of uh, your application title or something like that this is a great place to do that and automate that so that every time you do it going forward you don't have to remember the procedure forget a step or anything like that anymore you can automate that process and going forward, you'll be in a lot better place having a lot more consistent builds that you can do a lot faster. I was talking to a user yesterday who was talking to me about you know, having to do things in outage windows and, and uh, for his deployments, and George and I are really familiar with that. But what we love about this sort of uh, methodology is that outage window, us working you know, after hours, has gone from all night to an hour sort of situation. So that can be something that can really affect uh, not only how easily you do builds, but it can really affect your quality of life as well. Uh, so these are great things to incorporate in. And then over here we just have the, the final product, the uh, production app that's been deployed here. All right, so I mean, I hope you guys learned something today. This is really important stuff. It, uh, it can really make a difference in what your applications end up looking like, what your organization ends up looking like, and really just the overall product you're trying to convince. These, uh, the tasks that Randy was talking about, the continuous integration, that can apply to pretty much any application you're developing. That goes for Web App Builder, it goes for non-JavaScript API applications, so you can chain things together, like your middleware application, your JavaScript API application, anything in your suite, and really roll with it. We've got up here a number of resources. All of these slides are gonna be made available online. Um, so is this talk in general, if you wanna go back and rewatch and pick up anything you might have forgotten. We have here the, um, the whole enterprise build sample is at the top. 
Then we have the, uh, the NPM task. Um, both of those are open source and on GitHub. If you have issues, questions, or want to contribute to the build tasks, feel free. Um, we love hearing your feedback. We love making it better. It makes our lives better, too. Um, the other two are some of those more uh, generic sort of best server and web practices links I went over earlier in the presentation. So we have the, uh, the page speed insights along with those server config files. Uh, we'd really appreciate it today if uh, when you're done with this presentation, you uh, pull up the mobile app and give us a good rating uh, or just give us some feedback, but we like the good ratings better. So I think we've got, uh, yeah, we've got a little bit of time. Does anybody have any questions? Yeah? Okay, great. So the question is why would you use the whole Bower Esri Dojo build as opposed to just breaking up the uh, the grunt minify and tasks like that? Is that correct? Yeah, well like in the in your dojo build, I understand why you want to do that. Mm-hmm. Kind of just pull all the parts the other jobs that Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. So, so the difference between the two is if you're just using um, a grunt task to say uh, combine all your JavaScript files, what you're missing out on is uh, it maybe it'll strip comments for you, but it's not going to go through and um, obfuscate your code, uh, which is just the fancy term for like shortening all the variable names that it it can. Um, and quite honestly, uh, you need to make sure that you're not thinking about doing that obfuscation for security purposes. I, I hear that every once in a while, um, but the reality is that's no security at all. So don't think of it from that standpoint, but what you're doing is you're, you're saving bytes. Um, because you, as developers, we want to use good descriptive variable names, um, but if we use a variable name that ends up being you know 20 characters long and uh, what the dojo build will do is he'll shorten it to three, four, you, you know, maybe even shorter. Um, so it really helps save the amount of bytes that then come down over the wire. All right, any other questions? Yeah. So we talked about using web builders, um, obfuscation, but what would you recommend for this, like, widget development for any web builder? I know there's, like, some young tools and things like that that will do, like, the, the grunt Yep. Yeah, that's exactly what I would recommend for uh, for doing that sort of widget development. You know, keep it out of source. Con keep the whole app out of source control. This is something that you're going to tie in before you go to QA or to production. So you want to, you know, use the Yeoman tasks, use those grunt tasks to get your widget into an app, and then use these tasks to build that app and test it out. The question there, by the way, was um, how do you go about individual widget? development through this life cycle versus overall app development in the web app builder. Any other questions? Yep. Doing fielding, what's going on with uh, what widgets, what the widgets uh, that are packaged? So the question was what's going on with the web app builder widgets during the web app builder build? And what happens there is they're combined into another, into a separate layer file. So they're loaded all at once as one JavaScript file. But if you remember back to the blocking JavaScript calls, that one's actually, it's loading all the widgets asynchronously while the rest of the JavaScript API loads. Any other questions? There was one, yep. Yes. Um, yeah, sure. So in your, the way to do that is actually, um, 
You have to rename the, you can change the namespace, right? Yeah, actually, if, if you come up here afterwards, I'll show you what the Bower file looks like, um, because that's actually what the JavaScript API is doing with uh, dgrid in the 3x um, line of code. So dgrid in the 3x line of code has both the, I think it's 037 and the 110 version available within it. But the, the way that they've separated those two is by package name. And so in the Bower file, the way that they have them defined is they have one is dgrid and one is dgrid1, and then they point to the specific versions that they need to, to uh, pull down. So if you come up here, I can show you the example of that, uh, what that looks like. So the question is, are there any plans to include that build script with the Deb app, web app builder application in the core developer edition version? And uh, this is still pretty experimental. Um, I kind of developed this on my own time. And while, uh, while it's something I'm looking to talk about, it's nothing that's planned on the roadmap right now. Yeah, and the way that you install it currently um, actually tends to work better outside of the developer edition. So. Mm-hmm. Well, I mean, but, so whether you download the Web App Builder uh, application from online or from the developer edition, uh, the, the build will work with both. Yes. Yeah. But once you're ready to Yeah, even though it's partially built, it should still run through this task yeah. successfully. Yes? yes. The question was, does this, uh, does this Web App Builder build work on any version of the Web App Builder, or is it a specific version? And the answer is, unfortunately, it's a specific version. This is with the most recent version of the Web App Builder, and right now it's only in 2D. So one thing that you can do if you really need a 3D application or a specific version, go onto the GitHub and either make an issue that says that's something that you need and want, or um, feel free to just, if it's something you need to develop, go in there and contribute yourself. Yeah, so it's 2-3, two, two, right? Yeah. And I guess theoretically it might work with some of the other 2x versions, but y the only one verified right now is 2-3. So 1x, you'll, you, there is build scripts for 1x. You could go back and look at what we did last year. Um, and George's... Uh, it's in the same, um, it's in, under your account for that one, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah, so if you needed a 1x build, you could go look at George's GitHub account uh, where he listed the, um, the current Web App Builder build that we talked about, and there's an example of what we did 1x last year. But again, that's going to be like for the specific version of Web App Builder that was out at the time of Dev Summit. The other versions of 1x are try at your own risk. Maybe they'll work, maybe not. We're not sure. Uh, I just want to follow up on that first question that was asked over here about, um, you know, if you have a separate build system where you're running other build systems, you know, your own client, uh, that client, whatever you want to do, um, do you feel like, you know, that has to be in the JS API, you have to run that to the build build system, <laughs> So the qu the question was when we're uh, when we're using other tasks and you know things that aren't JavaScript API or aren't Dojo that have other sort of Uglify or Minify um, Bower tasks that can be built with, do we try to put everything into the Dojo build or do we go out and try to run parallel build processes? Yeah. Is that correct? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, and we're big fans of simplicity, so we'll generally just push everything through the Dojo API. 
and do that build. Um, we find it works very well. We find it's very good at different uh, AMD modules. So it does work for external libraries that are also built to AMD standards. But um, I know people that have used the required JS build processes successfully as well. And so it should be possible. We don't personally do it just out of the sake of simplicity. Um, the less moving pieces you have in your build is usually going to be the better way to do it in my mind. Yeah, you certainly could craft a careful uh, Dojo build profile to just build um, the mapping aspects of it separate from the rest of your widgets or application if you wanted. Um, but there's certainly going to be um, some nuances there that you'll have to work through to get that to work. Yes? I just find it easy. <laughs> I mean, we, we've, we've come up with a process that works for us. Um, I know uh, we, I don't think we've had a problem in years with problems of developing against the CDN and then switching it out, um, especially once Bauer came along um, into, and, and us publishing the APIs uh, into GitHub in, in a way that we could pull down with Bauer. Now that we have the consistency of knowing that we are getting the right versions of Dojo and if it's been patched in any way and, and things like that, now that we can be assured that we're getting the right versions of all those things, we really haven't had any problems in doing that. And so the, the fact that it's a CDN, um, Honestly, I hate downloading everything to my, in like my projects. So the less I have to download or you know, have Bauer copy into my project is better in my book. Yeah, and there's no reason that if you prefer to download it locally yeah. or if you're in a disconnected environment or I don't know, S3 is down for some reason, you, know, you can definitely apply these principles to the download version as well. We did not get enough laughs out of that S3 joke. Yes. Yes. No. So <clears throat> the way, it, at a very high level, the way the Dojo build works, and you could um, customize this somewhat to get a faster build. Um, but the way that it works right now is, so you download all the dependencies, and then when the Dojo build starts, what it does is it actually goes through and builds every single JavaScript file that's in every package that you put in the build profile. And so that's the intermediate step. And then as it's gone through and done that build process, what it's done is it's scanning and it's analyzing all the dependencies between, between things. So when it builds, when it brings all those files together into the layer files, it does through, so through like the dependency tree. So it starts with like, since we have like the loader for instance, like it starts with like all the dojo base files and pulls those in. And then it goes through that list of classes that you had there in the profile and says, oh, uh, well, George's uh, site manager depends on, you know, A, B, C, D, you know, and it pulls all those together and, and um, put them in such a way that you are guaranteed to have what you need at that time. And so then the output of that is that layer file that has all the dependencies pulled together. But it does that, it does that scanning so that it knows like all the dependencies at the time then when it's going to build the layer file, it can resolve those really fast. And um, I, I don't know if you saw it, but at least in this, in this latest build, uh, we, we have the build down to right around two minutes. Depending on how much I'm clicking on other things in my laptop, it takes like a minute 50 or so or whatever. And actually this task down here, um, I was surprised to find the, oh, can you flip over? Yeah, I was talking about my screen. So this task down here is actually the task that we ran last Dev Summit. I really didn't clean my laptop up after. So, uh, you know, you can see here it ran almost three and a half minutes. And I'm consistently getting build times in, in this new build of two minutes and less. So um, even with all those intermediary steps, um, 
you know, the fact that we're, we, we've changed a, just a few things about how we copy things, you know, we have a big improvement. And um, the, the other thing that I kind of like about not um, co-locating those is like, I like to keep my code separate. And actually that was one of the things we did last year with the Bower install. We actually deployed it, like copied all those things into our uh, web source file folder. And then it really bit me actually the other day uh, because I, I had to get ignore in the project to ignore all those things. And what I found was I was putting all the nice four, three ones in the build source. And then I was copying the old dojo all over. Um, so I, you know, it's a good separation of my code, their code and, and all that. So, um, but you, it's certainly a valid way to develop it. If you want to do that, list the uh, dojo, you know, in your dojo config in your index where all those packages live. That's, yeah, that's certainly fine. That was a really long explanation for you just wanting to. Uh, is there anything else? Any other questions? Yeah. No, it does not. Yeah, you would have to add, either add that on yourself or um, better control caching through your server headers if you want mm -hmm. to do that. All right, well, I think we're at time. If you have any other questions, feel free to come up. And uh, George and I will also be at the JavaScript island for, well, depending on how many questions people have uh, for the next hour or so before we come back here for testing here at 4 o'clock. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys.